the interests benefiting the lobbyists, and then the lobbyists benefit the members. Both during and after their time in Congress. During, they pay the members with cash, and I don't mean brown paper bags and bribes. I mean support for political campaigns, funding for campaigns. As the cost of campaigns has gone through the roof, members depend upon these funders. They spend 30 to 70 percent of their time raising money to get to Congress. The lobbyists become the suppliers of this, mon this money, or building upon the metaphor, the pushers for this money. During the time they're in office, the congressmen become dependent on them. And then after, they pay congressmen with their future. Increasingly, life in Washington is, as described by Congressman Cooper, a farm league for K Street, meaning just preparatory time before you go to work as a lobbyist. Members, staffers, bureaucrats increasingly have this common business model focused on life after government. Life as a lobbyist. 50% of senators leave the Senate to go work as lobbyists. 42% of members of the House. Everybody depends on this system surviving, and so it does. And then the members benefit special interests through policies that get changed to benefit the special interests, sometimes profitably. This bill was calculated to give the special interest a return on their investment for their money spent on lobbyists of 22,000%. The gain they got was 22,000%, more than it cost to hire the lobbyists. Sometimes brazenly, this man, John Campbell, a Republican from California, he's a landlord to six used car dealers. He gets between $600,000 and $6 million in rent from these used car dealers. He received $170,000 in campaign contributions from car dealers. And then as he sat in a committee that was reviewing this important new legislation, a bill to set up a financial protection agency, he got used car dealers exempted from the reach of that law. Because of course, whoever had a credit problem with a used car dealer, and that was because Democrats in the committee who supported him received more than two times the money from car dealers that people who opposed this did. And then sometimes grotesquely. The single not yet completely told most important story about what happened when Wall Street crashed is the story of the millions of dollars given to Democrats and Republicans alike to get them to stop regulating Wall Street, leaving Wall Street in the position where they could explode the bubble they had been bursting and bring down the economy around the world. Funding changes this democracy. This democracy, in this sense, gets corrupted. Now, the politicians deny this. The politicians say it's ridiculous. Can we get the sound up, please? Sir, sir, sir. Can we get the sound up, please, on the computer? Politicians say it's ridiculous. <laughs> Maybe it affects access, but it doesn't change results. They are shocked, I was told by one member of Congress, shocked at the suggestion that money might affect them. Remember this scene? Shocked, but of course, it's pretty hard to believe that money is not affecting the results, at least if you want to be charitable in interpreting what Congress does, because there's an extraordinary range of easy questions which is Congress just gets wrong. For example, the area that I spent more than 10 years of my life fighting about, copyright. That fight began on October 27, 1998, when Congress passed a bill in honor of this great American, Sonny Bono, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, which extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. Now, the question, Congress was to ask was, could it make sense to extend the term of an existing copyright by 20 years? Because, of course, copyright is intended to produce an incentive, and the one thing we know about life in a universe not governed by the physics of Star Trek is that incentives are prospective only. No matter what the U.S. Congress wants, it can't get George Gershwin to produce anything more. So obviously we thought this could produce no good public good, and we recruited, recruited this economist, 
Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman, right-wing economist, to write a brief in the Supreme Court challenging this extension. Friedman said he would join the brief only if the word no-brainer was in the brief somewhere. So clear was it that this could not have benefited the public good, but obviously there were no brains in this place when they passed this statute. An easy public policy question Congress got wrong. Or think about nutrition, something I'm thinking about working on much more these days. There's a consensus we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. 2003, the World Health Organization decided to advance pro, uh, policy on the basis of this consensus. They set a standard that said no more than 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugar. Well, the sugar industry, this has a sweet little logo here, they went ballistic on this. There they are, going ballistic. They said you should threaten to withdraw funding the United States Senate unless the WHO backs down from their recommendation. They wanted the WHO to say that 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. Well, the WHO didn't bat down, but the United States government did. In 2003, the Food Nutrition Board backed a standard that said 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. So that's a balanced diet according to our government. You can eat Fruit Loops or M&Ms for breakfast, a glass of milk and a cheeseburger for lunch, pizza, three slices of pepperoni pizza for dinner, and of course, sugar cookies for dessert. That's a balanced diet according to our government. Once again, an easy public policy question which the government gets wrong. But maybe most profoundly, think about the failure to act in the context of global warming. There's obviously a consensus among those who know something about it that we're doing it. As Al Gore puts it, the debate is over. There are five points in this consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. They wanted to evaluate how widespread that consensus was. So someone conducted a study surveying, surveying 1,000 peer-reviewed articles published between 1993 and 2003. They found that 0%, exactly 0 of those articles questioned that consensus. Then they did a comparative, comparable study of popular media articles, roughly in the same period, 600 articles. They found that 53% of those articles questioned the consensus about global warming. And that's the, progress, po that's the consequence of the extraordinary amount of money spent to promote junk science, to give the politicians an excuse for delaying doing anything about this, the most important public policy question the globe faces for at least 10 years. An easy question Congress gets wrong. Now these and other questions where Congress makes fundamental mistakes can be explained either in one or two ways. Either Congress is filled with idiots or money is having an effect on them. And in my humble opinion, our Congress is not filled with idiots. It is money that is corrupting these results. Now, whether you believe that or not, here's one thing that's absolutely clear. That's what Americans believe. Americans believe money by results in Congress that produces an enormous cynicism in Congress. The vast majority of Americans believe that this institution is corrupted. Indeed, more people supported the British crown at the time of the American Revolution than the support Congress today. That is democracy corrupted. Now think about culture corrupted. 1906, this man, John Philip Sousa, traveled to Washington to talk about this technology, what he called the talking machines. Here's what he said. These talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. When I was a boy, in front of every house in the summer evenings, you would find young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. Today you hear these infernal machines going night and day. We will not have a vocal cord left, Sousa said. The vocal cords will be eliminated by a process of evolution as was the tale of man when he came from the ape. 
Now, this is the picture I want you to focus on. Picture of young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. This is a picture of culture. We could call it, using a little bit of geek speak here, read-write culture. It's a culture where people participate in the creation and the recreation of their culture. In that sense, it's read-write. And Sousa's fear was that we would lose the capacity to engage in this rewrite creativity because of these, quote, infernal machines. They would take it away, displace it. And in its place, we'd have the opposite of rewrite creativity, what we could call, using modern computer terminology, a kind of read-only culture. A culture where creativity is consumed, but the consumer is not a creator. A culture, in this sense, top-down, where the vocal cords of the millions of ordinary people have been lost. Now, when you look back at the 20th century, at least in what we call the developed world, hard not to conclude that John Philip Sousa was right. Never before in the history of the production of culture had it become as concentrated, never before as professionalized, Never before had the creativity of ordinary people been as effectively displaced and displaced because of these infernal machines. Why was it like that? It's a great cheer for this point. Thank you very much. What explains the passivity? Who took it away? Who took away the vocal cords of ordinary Americans? Well, it was, as Sousa predicted, these infernal machines. It was technology. Largely technology, technology like this or technology like this that produced a culture that looked like this, the couch potato culture passively consuming culture fed to it, enabled efficient consumption, this technology, reading, but inefficient, at least amateur production, what we could call writing. It was good for listening, not good for speaking. It was good for watching, not good for creating. Technology gave us this read-only culture. That read-only culture was a corruption of the read-write culture of our past. Now, the critical thing to see about this read-only culture is that the law, in its nature, protects it. The law protects the business model of the read-only culture it protects the spread of copies like this and broadcasts through technology like this. These activities are regulated by copyright law because copyright law protects that form of commercial expression. But even so, through most of the history of copyright law, all of the history of copyright law before the digital age, the ordinary consumer's use of culture was unregulated by copyright law. So imagine a book in real space. If these are all the uses of a book in real space, an important set of these uses are unregulated by the law. So if you read a book, that's not a fair use of the book, it's a free use of the book because to read a book is not to produce a copy. If you give someone a book, it's not a fair use of the book, it's a free use of the book because to give someone a book is not to produce a copy. If you sell a book in American law, it's explicitly exempted from the reach of copyright law because to sell a book is not to produce a copy. And in no jurisdiction in the world is sleeping on a book a violation of copyright law because to sleep on a book is not to produce a copy. These unregulated uses of copyrighted works are then balanced with a set of regulated uses uses which the law must grant a monopoly to in order to create the incentive to produce great new works. And then in the American tradition, there's a thin sliver of exceptions, uses called fair uses, which otherwise would have been regulated by the law, but the law says ought to remain free. So the law regulated producers for all of the history of copyright law until the digital age, and it left consumers basically free. Enter the internet. And there is a radical change in this balance. Because in a digital environment, every single use of creative work produces a copy. And if the architecture of copyright law regulates every copy, that means we go from this balance of unregulated uses and regulated uses and fair uses 
to a world where every use is presumptively regulated by the law merely because the platform through which we get access to our culture has changed. This is the proverbial elephant in the room when we think about copyright regulation. Copyright in the past controlled a tiny slice of culture. As Jessica Lippmann put it, the turn of the century copyright law was technical, inconsistent, and difficult to understand, but it didn't apply to very many people or very many things. But today, it reaches now practically all of culture. As she says, most of us can no longer spend even an hour without colliding with the copyright law. And why? Well, again, it's a technical reason. The architecture of copyright law interacting with the architecture of digital technologies means if a copyright law regulates copies, then in the analog world, many uses are copyright free. But in the digital world, very few uses are free of the regulation of copyright law, the elephant in the room. Now, at first, when the internet came along, what it did was extend the read-only culture. Massively efficient technologies to enable people to get and consume culture created elsewhere. Napster, most famously. Apple's iTunes Music Store, most successfully. iTunes allowing you to buy for 99 cents any song you'd like and download it to your iPod. Of course, only to your iPod. But if you do that in America, at least you are deemed to be cool. This is good, but it's no different from the read-only culture of our past. It's read-only still. It's what Sousa still feared, a culture that would be corrupted by the passive consumption only of the culture around us. That's what it is still. Now, think a little bit about culture now uncorrupted. Because by 2004, this story about the internet had changed. What technology had taken before, technology now was giving back. It was the revival of a read-write culture. The poster child here is not Apple, it's Wikipedia. But the kind of revival I want to focus on, I call something like remix. So think about some particular examples in the context of music. Everybody knows this album by the Beatles called The White Album, which inspired this album by Jay-Z called The Black Album, which inspired this album by DJ Danger Mouse called The Gray Album which synthesizes the tracks of the White Album and Black Album together to produce something gray. That's 2004, two albums together. The modern equivalent is something like Girl Talk, which can miss 230 different tracks together in a particular performance or recording. Or think about film. 2004, Tarnation made its debut at Cannes, said by the BBC to wow Cannes. This is a film made for $218. The kid took video that he had shot at his home and remixed it using an iMac given to him by his friends and was able to wow Ken and win the 2004 Los Angeles International Film Festival. Or think about AMVs, anime music videos. Everybody knows animes, these Japanese cartoons sweeping at least American culture. AMVs are made by re-editing the anime and setting them to a music track. So here's a favorite example of mine. Or maybe most important in this context is politics. I've seen hundreds of these examples, but still the one that is most favorite for me is one I discovered first here in Brazil.
So that's remix digital culture. And the importance of this, of course, has nothing to do with a particular technique. Because, of course, this technique has existed in remix culture since the beginning of recorded film or records. What's important here is that the technique has been democratized. It's anybody with access to a $1,500 computer who can remix the sounds and culture from around us and express it on a free digital network in a way that speaks much more powerfully than words alone could ever speak. And then in 2006, the story changes again. Its main locus for this change in America is this platform called YouTube, which begins to emerge a kind of call and response from the creative community. So, for example, here's the most successful instance of this. Everybody knows this recording, classical recording by Pachelbel. So kid in his bedroom in a baseball cap playing Pachelbel on his guitar. More than 60 million people watch this video. 60 million, it's about 65 million right now. But that inspires more than thousand other people to build response videos that mimic or critique or do the same thing in a different context. Or consider this. This kid So about 1.7 million people see this. Then it inspires this video. Of course, it's about 3.2 million people who see this video. And then there are 12 other instances of people copying and remaking after they saw something before. Or, for example, you should know this famous Music video, sir. Okay, so this was then remixed, of course, on Saturday Night Live. That's Justin Timberlake remixing it. And then there were thousands of amateurs remixing the same thing. So here's the third break. four-year-old remix. And my favorite remix. One more example here. This in video. Soldier Boy Tough. Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called the Soldier Boy. You got a punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Inspired this video. You! Soldier Boy, what's up? Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called the Soldier Boy. You! You got a punch, then crank back three times from left to right. Oh, that inspired this video. You! Soldier Boy, what's up? Hey, I got the new dance for y'all called the Soldier Boy. Yeah. You got a punch, then crank back three times from left. Oh. So the point is, these are now conversations. They are the modern equivalent of what Sousa romanticized. The young people together singing the songs of the day or the old songs. But today, they gather not in the corner or in a backyard, 
but they gather on a digital platform that enables people from all across the world to share and to remake the creativity of others. This is culture uncorrupted. But the problem with this culture is the law's view. The law's view of this culture is that this read-write culture is illegal. DJ Danger Mouse knew that the Beatles would never allow him to remix his work. His work was actively attacked by the copyright industry to force people to take it down. This kid, after he discovered he could wow can for $218, then discovered it would cost over $400,000 to clear the rights to the music and the backgrounds of the video that he had shot. AMVs are increasingly getting takedown notices from artists who are not happy with the fact that their work has been remixed, even though as lovingly as these AMVs do. And then this is my favorite example. I don't care what you think about Tony Blair. I don't care what you think about George Bush. I don't care what you think about the war. The one thing you can't say about that video is what the lawyers said when they were asked for permission to remix those sounds with those images. They said, no, you cannot have our permission because, quote, it's not funny, end quote. So the point is the law looks at these two forms of culture, read-write and read-only, and says read-only is good, read-write is bad, and then the law wages a war. Well, the United States, we wage lots of wars, but the one I mean is the copyright war, a war which my friend, the late Jack Valenti, the former chairman of the Motion Picture Association of America, called his own terrorist war, where apparently the terrorists in this war are our children. They are fighting to preserve perfect control over culture because the 20th century taught us, or at least us in the United States, control is necessary here. But here's what you know about that control. There's no way that the law can kill this creativity. It can only criminalize it. Nobody's going to stop kids from taking sounds and images and making creative things with it. We can only drive it underground. Nobody's going to make my kids as passive with relationship to culture as I was growing up. We can only make them, quote, pirates. And the question democracies have got to ask is, does it do good to criminalize a generation? Kids in America live in this age of prohibitions. They constantly live their life in all sorts of facets of their life against the law. And that is corrosive. It is corrupting of the rule of law in a democracy. Now, democracy, uncorrupted. There is an extraordinary opportunity here in Brazil to do something about at least one form of this corruption. There are two reasons why there is that opportunity. First, as my friend, as my hero, Gilberto Gil, quoting another friend, another hero, Claudio Prado, put it, the extraordinary opportunity of Brazil is that it goes from the 19th century to the 21st. You've skipped the 20th century. Skipping the 20th century means you've been untouched by the repressive regime of the read-only culture. Here, read-write culture survives. It's how you breathe. Number two, there is in fact in Brazil, in the legal process of Brazil, enormous progress in this regard. The most recent proposed changes to the copyright legislation, as reviewed here by Volker Grasmuk, show that Brazil's proposed changes are the most progressive changes being made in any country around the world. Brazil has become a leader. It's been a leader at WIPO pushing the development agenda. It's been a leader standing up to extremism, the extremism which comes from the North. And that means there's an important opportunity here. And now let me be the scolding American. Seize this opportunity, Brazil. Number one, practice the balance we want, or more simply, practice what you preach. Show sharing, enable remix, use signs that say to the world, 
build upon my work the way I want to be able to build upon yours. That was the idea behind the project we launched seven years ago, the Creative Commons Project, to enable a simple way for authors and artists to mark their content with the freedoms they intended it to carry. So rather than the default all rights reserved, this means some rights reserved and some rights left open freely to the public. Since we launched this project almost seven years ago, there's been an explosion in the number of objects licensed under this license system. Now more than 350 million digital objects on the web licensed under Creative Commons license, including hundreds, millions in the Flickr library, including work by Radiohead, including Al Jazeera archives of extraordinary vid uh, video from the war on Gaza, including the White House, which this year released its content under a Creative Commons license, including, most importantly for me, Wikipedia, which this year switched over to the Creative Commons license, creating an enormous archive of interoperable free culture marked with this license. A license that says free, building the meme, which I first heard chanted here in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, free software, free culture, free software, free culture. That is the core of the ideal you can teach the world. Number two, you can build code here. The potential for the net and the mobile net to affect policy here is huge. It will change the way politics works, the way it changed the way politics works in the United States. And you should be making code to make this change, to make this democracy dependent upon the people. And three, finally, you need to help fight these corruptions, corruptions of a democratic system. You need to support reforms that would make democracies around the world more dependent upon the people and not dependent upon interests that try to capture the government. And you need to fight organizations that presume to speak for the people, but in fact speak for themselves. Or let me not be so cagey about this part. You need to fight organizations that presume to speak for the artists. The world is filled with, an ent with entities called collecting rights societies. The aim of these entities is good. And what they have done is fantastic, and some of them in the world are great, especially where these societies compete with each other, like in the United States and like in many countries in Europe because of the EU's anti-trust directive. These societies work hard to serve their artists and make sure their artists get the highest return those artists can. But some of these collecting rights societies are simple monopolists. And these societies are fighting change to preserve the opulent and opaque existence in which they live. You need to stand up to them. You need to demand reform from them and demand respect for artists and stop treating artists as kids. That's the demand that must be made to these societies to say to artists that they are entitled as the creator to say how their creativity grows and is spread. The critical point is you have this power here. You, these geeks in this extraordinary society. For five years, you will have better code and better insight into how to transform the society than any of the other forces that would resist you. You need to use that power for good. Thank you very much. Thank you. So happy to take questions. There's a mic right here. Oi. É, então, 
É, eu queria saber a respeito da sua posição é, Sorry, quanto. Sorry, it's not working. Uh, yes, então. I can. É, primeiro, agradecer a sua explicação tão clara e, e queria saber a respeito da sua posição é, mais, é, da forma mais clara possível sobre é, você ir contra a regulamentação do Google Books e o que, a, a proposta dos mesmos. Para o Google Books Storage Project. Sim. Bem, eu apenas publiquei um artigo nos Estados Unidos criticizando o book settlement. Not so much because I want to criticize Google. What Google did was an elegant kludge in the face of a very complicated, badly organized system of copyright law. Because of the way copyright law works right now, of the 18 million books that Google wanted to scan, 16% are in the public domain, 9% are under copyright and still in print, but 75% of those books are presumptively under copyright but out of print, meaning There's no one to ask permission from in order to scan them for any purpose beyond minimal use. So when the publisher sued Google, the publisher said, you are not allowed to scan any book under copyright without getting permission from the copyright owner, which would mean in the digital age, 75% of our culture would disappear because no one could get the permission if we can't understand who the owners are. The settlement tries to get around this. But for complicated reasons, I oppose the settlement because I think that what we need is changes in copyright law that cleared up the question of who owns what. At least a copyright system should make it easy to understand who owns the property that is allegedly controlled by copyright. And one of the most important parts of the, of the proposed change in the Brazilian law is that Brazil would be the first country to begin to make a maintenance requirement on copyright holders so that after a period of time, they would have to register their copyrights and at least we could begin to know who owns what. If every country did that, then I'd have no problem with a project like Google settling or getting into agreements with anybody because at least we would know which works were in the public domain and which works were protected by copyright. And so that I think that's the most important problem with that settlement. Mice. Oi, é, gostaria que você comentasse um pouquinho sobre Creative Commons aplicado na indústria farmacêutica, especificamente na questão da, dos remédios da AIDS aqui no Brasil, que com certeza você sabe muito bem. So Creative Commons is not yet deployed licenses in the context of patents, although we've started a project to do exactly that. And that's because obviously many people around the world recognize the extraordinary harm that comes from drugs that are priced at a level intended for rich markets being excluded from poor markets and from poor people in poor markets who need that. Um, so I think that there's a more fundamental change in patent laws that affects drugs that's necessary to make sure that drugs are accessible in the poorest countries in the world, even if the richest countries have to pay a premium for those drugs. Um, and I think that's especially urgent now, or it's especially justified now, because one of the most grotesque features of the Obama health care plan is that they've entered into agreements with the drug companies saying that they will never negotiate lower prices for drugs than what the retail price for that drug is. So the drug companies get not only the monopoly protection of patent law, but they also get an exemption from ordinary market forces to keep their prices high. Well, if they're getting that double payment in the United States, I think they should be able to afford to make these drugs more accessible in other countries around the world. Now, obviously, Brazil here, too, was the leader in forcing compulsory licensing in this context, and Brazil and India have done important work to make sure that there's an alternative um, uh, um, 
uh, regime of drug access that makes it possible for these generic drugs to be accessible. But I think more reform is necessary than that. Lessig. Eu queria pedir um comentário a respeito de um artigo recente do senhor a respeito de transparência, é, transparência política. É, a pergunta é, o senhor, você realmente acha que o excesso de, de demanda por transparência da sociedade prejudica de alguma forma os processos políticos numa democracia? Ou é só a polêmica que era... Não. Um... So... My view about transparency is it's here to stay, and that's a good thing. Just like my view of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing is it's here to stay, and that's a good thing. But even though it's a good thing that there's transparency, like it's a good thing that there's peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, there are costs that transparency imposes in certain contexts, just like there's costs that peer-to-peer -peer file sharing imposes in certain contexts. And what we need to do in both contexts is to accommodate those costs, not try to end transparency and not try to end peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, but find a way to compensate for the harms from transparency and find a way to compensate artists for the harms from peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Now, with respect to transparency, as I said in that article, the vast majority of transparency projects with the government I think are fantastic. And I was just uh, uh, talking today to uh, Marina uh, Silva about her transparency project to make it so that satellites would surveil logging operations inside the Amazon to make sure that they held to the standards that the law required and that data was accessible by activists to make sure that they were not over logging in those regions. I think that's an important, a precisely the use of transparency that's needed and there's a million contexts in which we ought to increase that. I was pointing to one particular kind of transparency, which in my view doesn't tell us anything. So, if you tell me that a congressman has accepted money from some special interest and then voted in a certain way, that doesn't really tell me why he voted the way he had voted. But 99% of Americans will say, I know he voted that way because of the money. So it can't help but bring disrespect to that congressman. So my statement was, we need a different system so that he doesn't get disrespect. And what is that different system? It would be public funded elections so that that congressman doesn't need to take money from private interest to get into Congress. Then we can be completely transparent about what the congressman does and we don't have any harm to the trust to that institution. So transparency is great. America needs more of it. Brazil needs more of it. Every government in the world needs more of it. But where it creates harm, let's deal with the harm and not try to end the transparency. And where peer-to-peer -peer file sharing does harm to artists by not compensating them, let's find a way to compensate artists without trying to break the internet and end peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. A última questão, the last question. É, algo relativo a, talvez relativo à questão da, da transparência, mas uma pergunta bem pontual. É, Por que o senhor interrompeu o seu blog? <laughs> Yeah, so I turned down, I, I stopped my blog. The biggest reason I stopped my blog was that I had become a target of malware. Extraordinary amount of, um, uh, there was even some child pornography malware put into the blog. There was a bunch of gambling malware. It was a constant hit of spam attacks. Um, and I, you know, I'm a, per, I'm a private person. I don't have a company. I don't have people who can maintain it. I had one volunteer who was trying to help and it just became impossible to to keep it. So Google delisted me at a certain point because there was so much junk inside the blog. Now, I am trying to reorganize resources to make it so I can afford to have the blog hosted in a place that takes care of that problem. And within the next two weeks, you're going to see a posting on the blog that announces this and invites people to, you know, to make proposals. I don't want to ask for anything for free. Even though I support free culture, I don't support slavery. So I'm not asking for free labor in that sense. But I do want to try to get you know, people who support this movement to help to make, this, make it possible for me to revive the bog. So it's a long winter of hibernation, but I'm hopeful we can get it back as soon as I can deal with this really bad problem. Thank you very much. This has been fantastic I, to be here.
Valeu, pessoal!